Colombo University Faculty of Science Alumni Association, CAFSA, proudly presents a distinguished speaker series to uplift the knowledge of aspiring students and budding scientists in the Faculty of Science at the University of Colombo and Sri Lanka as well. In this series of lectures, CAFSA features accomplished scientists and key opinion leaders in different science streams to present the advancement in their field of expertise. This seminar series is a collaborative effort between CAFSA and the Columbia University Faculty of Science. Welcome to the Distinguished Speaker Series of CAFSA. Hello everyone, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good, good evening. Uh, so everyone who is joining uh, from different part of the world. Uh, so uh, I welcome you all for CAPSA Distinguished Speaker Series, uh, our first uh, speaker uh, series talk uh, for 2024. And uh, yeah, so uh, today's speaker is uh, Professor Sandun Pereira. Uh, who is an associate professor at the University of Nevada, Reno. He's going to deliver the talk on enhancing your career options through data-driven or industry-focused research. So before uh, going into introducing the speaker in more detail, uh, so let me remind you a few things. Uh, uh, so after our speaker uh, uh, deliver the talk, uh, so we'll have a Q&A session of uh, roughly around 15 minutes. Uh, so you can uh, actually, you don't need to wait until the end uh, of the talk. So you can type your quest uh, questions in Zoom chat window. Uh, uh, we normally also do it at you in YouTube live stream, but unfortunately it's not working uh, uh, this time. But you can type your questions in uh, Zoom chat window. And at the end, uh, I will ask uh, questions uh, one by one from the speaker. So yeah, share your questions during the talk as any uh, thoughts come into your mind. All right, uh, so actually, uh, so it's been very, uh, it's our pleasure to invite uh, Professor Sandun Pereira and thank you for accepting the invitation and uh, um, delivering this talk today. So Professor Sandun Pereira, as I mentioned earlier, is an Associate Professor of Business Analytics and Operations, uh, College of Business, University of uh, uh, Nevada, Reno, and uh, he uh, he has an impressive uh, uh, career. And uh, Sandun Pereira received his PhD in operations management as well as an MBA and MS in supply chain management from Jindal School of Management at the University of Texas at Dallas. He also holds a PhD in financial mathematics and a master of science degrees in statistics and applied mathematics and mathematics from Florida Atlantic University. He earned his BS in finance, business and computational mathematics with first class honors from the University of Colombo, Sri Lanka, with impressive total of seven academic degrees, including two PhDs and four master's degrees, Sandun, was recognized as the most uh, credentialed uh, Sri Lankan in 2018. So uh, his research actually uh, goes through the different aspects of uh, supply chain uh, and other things related uh, uh, to that. And uh, I'm not going to tell that details. So Professor Sandun Pereira can uh, tell you more about uh, his work and uh, hopefully inspire a young generation uh, uh, to uh, 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 come to uh, this uh, field. So Professor Sandun Pereira, again, uh, uh, it's been a pleasure to have you here. Uh, over to you. Uh, thank you, Sajid. Uh, and also thank you for having me here today. Uh, and also I would like to thank Ashan, Dr. Ashan, uh, for coordinating uh, this event and then uh, I'll jump into the talk, uh, you know, because there are a lot of things uh, we can talk today. Uh, I will share my screen and um, are you able to see the main PowerPoints of the presentation? Ah, uh, yes. Okay. Good. Uh, so 
as uh, Sachit uh, introduced, you know, like I'm going to talk about uh, enhancing your career options through data driven and industry focused research. So I was very careful when I was picking the title. Uh, uh, at the beginning, I wanted to say industry driven, but you know, as somebody who work in academia and also in business, uh, we want to be leaders for industry. So we want to you know start off with some sort of modeling simulation and provide insights to industry. So that's why I uh, was very careful not to say industry driven, uh, but it's mainly data driven and industry focused research. I'll get uh, you know into more details about it. Uh, when I go through a uh, research, you know, part of the presentation. So this is kind of the rough plan, but uh, I will be jumping around certain uh, bullet points. Uh, I will try to first talk about background on business schools uh, and then also the programs, so because most of you have background in science and engineering uh, fields. So. I thought it might be a good idea to start off with some background in business schools. And then I will talk about what is managerial science and then research within managerial sciences. Uh, about trends and opportunities, I will be, I think probably talking about trends throughout the talk as well as opportunities for students. Whenever I uh, feel like I can share certain you know, opportunities or tips uh, to, you know, uh, go through this uh, path and then I will uh, add those things. And then at the end, I can share, especially for students, you know, my two cents about, you know, how I think about research, life and everything, you know, uh, all together, you know, as a package. So first part of the presentation. So uh, if you think about business schools, uh, so it's very important for business uh, school, uh, schools to be accredited by uh, AACSP, so which is Association of Advanced Collegiate uh, Schools of Business. So roughly around thousand schools have this, uh, you know, accreditation right now. Uh, these are the major programs uh, in those schools, and if you look at the numbers in parentheses, like uh, seven hundred thirty-seven, uh, like schools out of those. Uh, thousand schools have management programs. And likewise, so uh, the, my area is productions, operations, and supply chain and transportation. So it's only about, uh, you know, roughly around 200 schools have it, both programs. Uh, and then, but among these fields, all the fields I highlighted in particular are very quantitative areas. Some fields of management also have quantitative aspects of, to it, but uh, most of the finance programs, accounting programs, marketing, but marketing also has softer side, but also a very uh, quantitative data-driven side. And uh, computer information systems or management of information systems, data analytics, supply chain productions. All of these area are very quantitative uh, and basically driven by managerial sciences. So that is something I wanted to, you know, say upfront because these courses are taught within business schools and taught by people with, you know, quantitative training. Uh, and then if I go to department wise, if I go to main departments, if you think about what could be the main departments within the business school. So these are the uh, main areas I can think of. Uh, you know, accounting departments, finance, marketing. I'm in a marketing department, by, but tr by training, I'm a supply chain and operations person because uh, University of Nevada doesn't have a uh, operations and supply chain department. So I'm within the marketing department. And then <clears throat> information systems and management uh, and supply chain and operations. And uh, so the those bullet points which are in purple are again, very tech heavy in research and teaching, most of the cases. I put red for economics because some business schools have economics department outside the business school. For example, if you think about the UPenn, uh, Wharton Business School have a, don't have the major economics part within the business school. They have applied economics, but not traditional economics. So which is a different uh, school. Uh, 
at UNR, we have economics within the business school. So, but economics is again, you know, very quantitative uh, theory driven area. Uh, when I say theory means uh, mathematical theory driven area. So, so eco economics could be outlier, but still very quantitative. Even in management, some areas, not IB or maybe OB, but some strategy people use a lot of data analytics. And also uh, in accounting, accounting by nature is uh, quantitative, but it's slightly different flavor. Uh, so even for the ACSB, we have different accreditation for the accounting area. So they have different certifications and different evaluation processes as well. So these are the like main areas. So if I want to kind of interpret these as sciences, the simple definition is that are we using any scientific approach to provide more informed decision-making rules for managers? So if you think about most of these areas, they use scientific tools to provide you know, decision-making uh, rules for managers. So that's why these are listed or maybe considered as managerial sciences, right? So that's my simple definition about managerial sciences. Uh, so science is everywhere, so by nature. So, but, so we are not outliers. So I think the, when I was a student back in Sri Lanka, so the feeling we got, okay, if you go to commerce area or management area, if you go to uh, any faculty outside, like, I mean, basically most of the many, in, when I was at Columbia University, I remember we had management, you know, faculty. And most of the people who studied those managerial subjects are not qualified to do higher studies in business schools here, especially PhDs. Because people who are basically from engineering background or mathematics background are more you know, trained to do higher studies in these areas. So I didn't know that. So I had to spend five years, six years to figure it out after uh, coming to US. So I thought it might be a good idea to let our new students, you know, to let uh, know about that uh, upfront, right? So as I said, you know, one of my main focus uh, is, you know, basically students uh, who are interested in higher studies. So I'll talk about business schools and then PhD programs. What is the easy path to get into this? So, First of all, like uh, I want to ask a simple question, like why business schools? I mean, my story, I didn't know uh, there's a lot of disparity in terms of business school and uh, science and engineering, and also different ways of like, you know, uh, excelling in your career within different schools. When I started my PhD program, but I remember one summer, my advisor was like teaching so many summer classes and writing proposals for grants. So I was having a chat with him, like why you have to work so hard in the summer uh, when you you know, can focus on other things such as research. He said like, you know, my kids go into college. I feel like I need to have some extra income. And I was a little bit concerned at that time. Okay, so I wanted to be a professor for sure, but like, then having to go with those, you know, all extra teaching and uh, all of this proposal writing, I felt like it's kind of a, too much work at that point. So then I was exploring a little bit more about other areas, like because I was doing financial math. That's when I realized in uh, there's a sal like in terms of salary, there's a lot of disparity in academia, in especially in US. Like uh, you could get. Although this is not my main goal, but I learned at that time, honestly, you could get paid two, three times higher in a business school doing the same job. Uh, that was a kind of a shocking surprise for me at that time. And then I was also looking into the proposal writing. Okay, why don't we have, why don't business school faculty do, have to write proposals? So I realized they are self-funded and all of these you know, uh, facilities are there for them. The, then that was one reason. Uh, and then coming back to PhD positions in business schools. So they actually really manage the input output ratio. So if you think about a science program, so they would admit about 10 to 20 students on average, depending on the size of the school and how much funding they have. 
the program I got admitted at FAU admitted 15 students that semester. I have heard about some other schools, they admit about five or maybe 15, depending on the size of the school. And business schools usually admit one or two students. Uh, the downside of that would be that it's, it would be extremely difficult to get into business schools uh, because you know only one or two students get admitted. But if you get in, there's guarantee you can get a tenure track position after graduation without having to do the postdoctoral programs also. So if you go to a postdoctoral program, it would be very rare in a business school. Uh, either you uh, don't want to go to a teaching uh, position in a, in a business school and you want to wait and publish more and get a research position. Um, so in that case, they will delay. And I have seen also a new trend uh, in like top schools in business schools, like they get the position and defer the starting date by one year and go to a company like Amazon or Google to get experience. So that's a that's the only time they do a post-structural training or research associate position. And uh, then, you know, again, in terms of teaching, there are schools that has two zero teaching load, two one, three three. So some people don't like three three or four four teaching load. That means you teach eight courses per year. Four four means a two one means you teach only three courses per year. So some people delay to get more publication. This is very rare. I would say like uh, less than five percent of the people go to a postdoctoral position in business schools. So you can get a tenure track faculty position because they only admit like one or two students, there's a high chance that you will get a tenure track position, right? And if it's very easy to get a job and you would, and I said, I will convince you, you would be doing pretty much same thing in terms of uh, tools you use for your research and teaching. Uh, so it should be, you know, very convenient for everybody to do, uh, you know, a degrees in business, right? Given that they like that area, but there's no free lunch. Uh, so one of the things I find like super important for business school research and teaching and to get into a program is a soft skill. So which sometimes uh, some of us can uh, develop over time, but it's very hard to teach soft skills. You have to learn by yourself most of the time. And so that's another reason I have these three options. If you want to get into business school, a PhD program, I would say if you're coming from Sri Lanka, doing a master's in a business school and get to know the professors would be the easiest path to go. For example, at UNR, our MBA students are, some of our MBA students are funded. So they will get a graduate assistantship while they're doing MBA and then they can uh, get a tuition waivers and they will get a stipend. So while you're doing the MBA, you can get to know the professors. And then if you apply that way to the business school program, you have a higher chance. Because, you know, if you really think about math area, if I go through the transcript of the students, I can have a very good idea about the hard skills students have. But the soft skills you get to know about, you know, these students while you are dealing with uh, these students and working with these students. So if you think about all the top programs, they will recommend students from one top program to another program. So that one or two students who get admitted are really, you know, within that click. So if you're coming from Sri Lanka or outside USA, you have to have, I mean, first of all, all the cohorts I had at UT Dallas PhD program had like 95 percentile for the GRE, both, you know, uh, quantitative and English part. And uh, they also have GMAT. So they, you have to have very high percentile for those two exams. Uh, and then uh, the second part, you really have to convince those, uh, you know, admission committees that you have soft skills. So that's why I think it's better to do a master's first and then try to transit uh, from there, right? In my case, I was lucky I didn't have to, I would never be able to get 95 percentile for English part of GRE, but I was very lucky that I had a PhD, so they waived that requirement for me. So, and that's another way, but it's a very long route and you have to be super patient, go on that route. 
but some people come to do a PhD uh, in statistics or master's in statistics operations, applied math, but then you can talk within schools in a college and state convenience, right? So that's another part too, you know, you don't have to do MBA, but you can do other masters in other fields, especially science fields, right? Okay, I'll talk about this more. Uh, I think probably you will have some questions on this part as well. Uh, so going into main research streams, uh, I'm by training an analytical uh, uh, modeler, like a modeling person uh, in, in within business school research. So I work on continuous time and discrete time modeling, as well as stochastic and deterministic modeling. But recently I switched my focus also to empirical uh, methods uh, due to various reasons, like uh, there's a lot of demand for empirical research right now. If you are from statistics department, that's kind of your bread and butter. So you would be able to do most of the empirical research. And then in empirical research, I can think of like experiment versus observational or maybe quant quantitative versus qualitative research, right? But like uh, another reason I switched to empirical when you kind of get senior over time in terms of, uh, you know, your academic field and I I I kind of figured that I can get a uh, lot of uh, graduate students and free labor when I do work on empirical uh, methods because uh, the people who work on empirical research is a larger group like seventy to eighty percent I would say the modeling world is very niche and if I work on a modeling uh, analytical modeling uh, research and I will have to do most of the time uh, the work by myself so even I'm in a team so. That's the trade-off there. <clears throat> I will talk about all of these uh, modeling approaches and various areas kind of through my research. So I will switch to that part. I, I kind of nitpick like three projects uh, based on the techniques and the focus I had. So this was uh, supposed to be part of my dissertation. We started this project in 2013 when Jeff Bezos came up with this drone delivery idea. Uh, and then it was in cooking or you know in progress for seven years. So finally we published in 2020. So this was on uh, retail deliveries, how uh, you know the logistic networks would change as a you know industry. Uh, you know, if the retailers start using uh, drone delivery and in case you don't know some cities in US right now, they have drone delivery available. So this was a very highly received paper out of, of most of my papers was published in Productions and Operations Management, which was one of our top three journals in the area. And uh, which was also ranked in uh, uh, basically 99 percentile, uh, top 1% of the research uh, in terms of uh, publicity mainly. Uh, and then uh, we had a lot of uh, media attention for this one uh, as well. And uh, one reason because, uh, you know, most of the companies like Amazon, Google Wing and other companies are very interested in this. Uh, and then we even got a partnership invitation from Google Wing to implement uh, drone uh, technology in Dallas. Uh, we didn't pursue it because I wanted to do it in Reno, but they really wanted to do it in, in Dallas. So eventually we uh, didn't pursue that uh, opportunity. But in terms of techniques I use for this project, I simply use my uh, optimization skills. So this was, of course, we solved sequence of models for this paper. So this is one of those models. So where we, if you are from math department right now, this is your bread and butter. So this is a simple continuous time uh, constraint optimization problem with two variables. We solve sequence of problems of this nature in this research. So we uh, we call this kind of research as stylized research. So we make assumptions based on how consumers would behave for different delivery guarantees. And then we justify our assumption. Again, the justifying part is the hardest part. The hardest part is not to solve this one. The hardest part is to convince the reviewers, you know, uh, that these are the 
you know, basically preferences consumers have for these delivery guarantees and underlying assumptions are met and all of those things. Uh, it's part of, I mean, yes, it's hard skill as well as soft skills because I would say most of the research I work right now, if you go into my research uh, uh, part of the CV, like are with uh, international people, like people from uh, China and India, and they have the hard skill, but sometimes they don't have the soft skill to sell their research, right? So I mostly join into those projects at that point and try to help them to justify the assumptions and then you know selling the idea part, right? So that is one of the projects. So main takeaway, this is industry focus. We did not, because the drones were not implemented in industry. We were thinking about future delivery business in US and came up with economics-based assumptions and try to give some insights. And the good news is that I have fought with the editors about this kind of research because they say you have to do industry driven. I, I always argue like, no, we can be also leaders for industry and tell industry what to do in the future. So this is one of those projects, industry focus, but we didn't use data from industry for this one. Uh, I will then jump to a project uh, I wanna call data driven. So this one, uh, you know, in classical modeling, uh, when you come up with assumptions and models, people ask like, how practical this thing is? Can you, can you validate your model with data? So this was, this project originally started based on uh, my discussions with friends uh, from one of the oxygen manufacturer. So they have this large at home oxygen manufacturer. So you people live on these machines, basically. If there's a failure in these machines, they have to immediately call and they will send a replacement within hours. But some cases, you know, they cannot send a replacement machine within a day. So that's very serious for the patient, could be very detrimental for the patient's health. So in that case, I was asking, you have the backup portable machine, why can't you just bundle these two products, sell it as one? So they can switch to the uh, you know portable machine and then you can do the repairs of the original machine within the you know, time. Uh, basically this one will have like a couple of days of life. So maybe you can use it temporarily until you get the <clears throat> original machine fixed, right? And then we were thinking in a larger scale, this problem like, if you think about uh, industry 4.0, now we talk about industry 5.0, like all of these smart machines, like additive manufacturing. So they have a lot of sensors. You collect data, you know, per seconds. And these are big data problem. I don't want to oversell this problem as a big data problem, but you collect a lot of data and data have basically high speed data. There's variety in data. There's uncertainty in data. There's, you know, if you, pick all the boxes for big data. So this qualifies as a big data problem. So they collect a lot of data and then they have to decide, these machines are super expensive machines. If you think about like, you know, this attitude manufacturing, uh, they have one large machine that does pretty much most of the work for them. They cannot interrupt the process, but they can switch to a backup process if there's a problem uh, in the original machine. So they will be collecting a lot of data. How do we use that data to model uh, this, their control problems? Like, so in terms of maintenance, they're talking about predictive maintenance, not you know, uh, reactive maintenance, so predictive maintenance. They will predict when they need to do the maintenance before there's a failure and then try to fix those. Unfortunately, I will have to show you a couple of equations, but I will come back to the takeaway of this project as well. For this project, I use my skills from a stochastic modeling for my first PhD. So we assume that the processes, these machines governed by some stochastic processes, what we call the geometric Brownian motions. So these are condition-based maintenance problems for these uh, manufacturing facilities. And uh, so to as you know, then in the past, we did not use data to validate these models. For this project, we use data from industry to validate the models. We show that you know data justify our model. And then 
for this, this is one, one takeaway for you. We had to show that this data follows a geometric Brownian motion. We used two sets of data, one from uh, IEEE, uh, from an original manufacturer, and then the other one from a plant-based company from India. They have this, you know, in, in, in the, India, they have to use oxygen uh, to survive in certain cities. So they have plants that generate oxygens. For these uh, plants, they have to replace again when the plant get kind of reached the maximum uh, level, they have to replace the plant with another one. So we used data from both and we validated the models. So if you think about the models, it was about the QQ plot and correlation charts and we used Shapiro-Wilkes test. I'm talking to statistics people right now. So all of this statistical testing, you know, and we had to do the histogram to verify whether it's normal. <clears throat> And all of these things we have learned in our statistics classes. We use those skills first. Second, uh, this part I didn't learn as an undergrad, but I learned for my PhD uh, uh, in math. And so these are, if you think about statistics and probability, you know, probability is a measure, right? So we use measure theory and control theory uh, to come up with a policy and we prove the optimal policy is a, uh, modified two band control. So one thing, I'm doing this res research right now uh, and the skill set I developed was from my first PhD, control theory. So I'm using my math PhD background to model this problem. And actually this uh, modified two band control policy was the main contribution in my math PhD dissertation. So I'm using that for PhD application and the first article uh, was written on this one. Uh, it's on uh, impulse control theory with random reaction period, which I co-authored with Alain Ben Susan. In case you don't know who's Alain Ben Susan, Alain Ben Susan is the founder of con impulse control theory. So he developed this QA approach. So we use the QA approach, which I kind of modified in my dissertation. And the problem was a simple control theory problem. Uh, and then to come up with estimation process. So we wanted to estimate the model when data becomes available. So we use uh, MLEs, the maximum likelihood estimators. If you in statistics or a probability theory in math, this is again something we have learned in class, maximum likelihood estimate. So we use that to estimate the models on the go. And of course, then we came up with different policies, how industry can use these estimation ideas. And actually what we wanted to prove was something very simple. We said like, okay, there could be premium policies, but could be very expensive because you have to store data in the cloud. And that is not feasible as well as super expensive, but the basic plus, which is which requires only three, uh, you know, relatively low frequency updates for the policy uh, can be uh, almost as good as optimal. But main takeaway for you, it's that I use my background from stochastic control theory and parameter estimation. here. So stochastic control theory is from math, parameter estimation from math or stat. Large, so this is mainly focused on students who have statistics background. So this was a paper which was accepted last November. Uh, it will be a uh, I think published in Productions and Operations Management, again, uh, one of our top three journals. So this project, we use data from United Nations and World Health, Health Organizations. And we are working on multiple projects on this one right now. In case you don't know what is this circle about, this is, uh, uh, these are sustainable development goals. So, uh, and you know, we are, you know, just like we talked about carbon footprint in the past, how much, you know, carbon emissions we do, we will be talking about how the businesses, how the operations, how the things we do contribute for sustainable development goals as a world, like as a whole, right? All, uh, so this will be a very interesting topic forthcoming. And our goal was to provide guidelines for funding managers and healthcare policymakers. So if you think about my research, it's on disruptive technologies in supply chain, and then healthcare operations management. So this is the healthcare operations management problem. So we were trying to give policymakers an idea about when and where the development aid would be effective. 
now we are working on uh, regional level uh, problems like you know Africa versus Asia, and we are trying to be in touch with the uh, UN for this uh, one because we need more data. So this project, this is going to be again basic statistics for some of uh, master level students and most of the faculty in statistics department should know all of these models. So we started with simple fixed effect models and did Poisson regression, threshold, threshold regressions. We used feasible generalized least squares and generalized method of movements, event study methods based on when they announced this and then use a couple of moderators. And you know we had the time fixed effects, country level fixed effects. And this is also not like heavy modeling in terms of statistics, just uh, simple data analysis. So for this project, uh, of course, we use a lot of data, but other than that, I don't think it is groundbreaking in terms of technique. So these are very standard statistics techniques, right? So that's another project. So I talked about three different projects. So first one was about uh, industry focus, the drone project. The second one, uh, you know, on the uh, basically condition-based maintenance is data-driven uh, modeling. And third one is purely empirical. So all of these things, you know, based on tools we have learned in science. So like my main takeaway before I jump into the next slide, these are the skill sets like we learn in, in science in math and stat mainly and engineering. So you could do very successful research in a business school if you have this skill set. Only thing I think you might have to learn over time is the soft skill. But if you get into a PhD program in business, your professors would be able to help you to develop soft skills, right? <clears throat> and then in terms of new trends in this area, I think diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility is a huge topic. Uh, they talk about fairness, and fair, I have a paper on fairness concern, uh, Nash bargaining equilibrium. And then uh, right now I'm working on a bundling project. It's about inequity aversion. So, you know, people think, okay, like by the, buying this bundle product, I get this much utility for me, but how much profit do you make? So the consumers are very sensitive to profits the companies make right now. So because they are fairness concern. So that is a project we are working on. Then disruptive technologies. I'm working on a couple of projects on drone delivery networks, how the trucks and drones can be used simultaneously. When will we switch from truck delivery to drone delivery completely, or do we have to do it in every single city? So that's a problem we are working on disruptive technology. And AI is really peaking right now. Uh, we are. I have a paper, working paper on how we audit the algorithms companies use. Like, uh, you know, can we audit the algorithms at the federal level or can we uh, audit the algorithms at the state level? Again, you know, there's evidence about algorithm being not fair. You can micro-target consumers based on whether you use the mobile phone to search for a product. So there was a case about a home depot using uh, micro-targeting to uh, show higher prices for the consumers who browse products, uh, you know, inside the uh, store. So it's about fairness concern algorithms, you know, towards the customers. And another one is uh, environmental, social, and corporate governance. This used to be an old topic, but it's just coming back again because, uh, you know, we care about, you know, carbon food footprint, and green credits initiatives and all of those things. And then social, uh, you know, again, fairness concern, and then also the corporate governance. So uh, I will be uh, editing a special issue for transportation research part E uh, on this topic. So this is again, a very uh, hot topic right now. So let me switch gears. Uh, um, how much time such it do we have? I think you're muted. Right? You can continue. You don't need to worry. <laughs> mm -hmm. Good. So, so my main message out of all of this, uh, there's a path for you to come to business schools. And then uh, like for students, you know, you should not think 
this is a different world. This is something, you know, if I could come from math department, Columbia University and follow these programs and research in this area successfully, uh, and you could do it too, right? So that's the part I really want to come. And then you will, you will have an advantage. You will have a competitive advantage compared to many students in terms of hard skills, because we are very well trained in Sri Lanka. Right? But I strongly recommend getting a master's because the path is very, you know, tough. And if you're directly coming from Sri Lanka, it doesn't mean you can't do it, but it's very hard to do it. So for the rest of the time, I will try to talk about, uh, I'll try to give a couple of tips for my, uh, like mainly for students. And I know we have experienced faculty, but they can add, uh, they can add, uh, more to this uh, during our discussion session. But so, I mean, most of the time, this is how people introduce me. I don't think this is me. So I think none of this would be possible if this is not me. So this is my number one advice for students. Uh, try to have, you know, balanced life. I mean, yes, you can be productive, but you would be much less productive. I have seen people really suffer during pandemic because they didn't have a life beyond their professional life. So make sure, you know, you have, I mean, I mean, these are, I'm going to call in a minute, good distractions. Having hobbies, having things to do, having somebody to, you know, uh, turn into or share your thoughts about everything. So it's super important. So uh, this is part of like having a balanced life, right? Uh, I mean, this week is very important. We have annual evaluations coming up. Uh, I have evaluated so many faculty because I'm in the committee this year. And so there's a lot of deadlines I have to satisfy. So yesterday was Sunday. Can you guess what I was doing yesterday? So this is what I was doing. So I watched one game after another game and another game. So those who are in US, you know, like we had uh, uh, two important football games. So I watched that and I supported Detroit Lions. Of course, you know, they lost uh, very sadly, but, you know, I watched that. Then got, Nevada was doing really well in uh, basketball this season, but they got humiliated at New Mexico uh, because nobody has won in that state, uh, you know, in their home field. Uh, so, but I watch these three uh, games without doing anything. These are, I call basically good distractions. And another thing I do, you know, do have hobbies like, you know, I listen to music a lot. So those are the things I did yesterday. I didn't do anything related to my research or uh, whatever I'm, I'm gonna have to do in this week at the university. So try to have good distractions in your life. That's going to balance you. Of course, having family and friends and additional things to do is important, but also you know, other things you can do. I'm not gonna give a huge lecture on like finding the right balance for you, but you have to experience it and find the right you know, balance for you. I mean, different people have different approaches, but have something other than research and profession, right? To uh, you know, balance your life. So I will be talking about other things. So this is again, focusing on students. I'm pretty sure you may have heard this somewhere. So there's a path for you. And if you find that path, then, then the sky will be the limit. Uh, I usually do a survey. Uh, last time when I did a survey, I believe it was at maybe University of Peradeniya or some university. So 95 plus percentage of the students said, yeah, this is true. Uh, that's the response I got most of the time when I did the polls. Uh, but whoever, I mean, remember you are in Sri Lanka as a student. Whoever told you that must have said this also at the very beginning of that. Because in my opinion, this is again, these are purely my opinion. Somebody could have totally different opinion. In my opinion, if you're in Sri Lanka, I felt like there was no path. The path was not clear. Uh, so you have to create your path. If you think about most of the people who came to US or other country and become successful, they have created their path one way or another way. So if you create your path, you'll be more successful and you know then the sky will be the limit. So you don't want, I mean, 
if you really think about following someone else, but you will never be able to most of the cases overcome that person because that person created the path. But uh, other thing, you know, you know, it's how difficult it is to get a scholarship to come to US, especially for business schools. I told you how hard it would be, but um, even for science, you know, it's, it's becoming increasingly difficult. I'll also talk about that little bit, um, at least based on my experience talking to a couple of Sri Lankan faculty who are in business schools, our reputation is slightly going down. So we, I had never heard about students who failed the qualifying exams coming from Sri Lanka, but we have heard a couple of stories about it. I even had to talk to one of the students who got really depressed recently uh, from one of the you know top universities in the US who came, he was the batch top at Katubad and came to US University and struggled a lot in the PhD program. So we have to change that, you know, as a group, this culture, because we used to have a very good reputation. We still have it in certain areas, but in like business area from what I heard. So we are a little bit hesitant right now to recruit some students because, uh, okay, that's another difference between business schools and uh, science. There's a lot of, work in business school graduate as a graduate student. You will feel very overwhelmed in many of the cases. I remember my PhD in math versus PhD in business. Uh, like I slept very little in the PhD in business uh, because in math, it's all about thinking, but there's a lot of additional work. Sometimes you feel like it's unnecessary, but in business school. Well, so that's a trade-off, you know, like when you think about life as a student. So some students really crumble under the pressure. So we can change it together. But again, you know, we have to change this, you know, mindset, you know, and then maybe be gritty, right? Uh, perseverance, right? Like I picked Sangakara for a reason. Uh, I'm pretty sure there have been many Mahalas. Uh, I had privilege of seeing both of them in person because I was only two years junior to Mahela at high school. I had chance to at least ball at him a couple of times. And I think he's very well gifted player. Sangakar was parallel to us at Columbia University. I have seen him uh, playing at the you know ground in front of the math department. Uh, Sangakar is a very gritty, gritty uh, and player. And he if he gets out on a certain like stroke, he will practice that so hard. So he's very persevere in that sense. And if you really think he's the most successful in terms of all the records. Uh, we probably have, Mahel was lucky in the sense he had the blessing from Ma Roshan Mahanam and Arjuna and all of these people. Otherwise, there may have been a lot of Mahelas who got lost because they were not persevered enough. Uh, coming back to this story to academia, I have seen a lot of smart people, much smarter than me. Uh, I, can, I can think of 10 people in like few seconds right now but in terms of success, I don't know how much they achieve eventually uh, because I think they were not gritty. Also, they were not hardworking. So hardworking and grittiness is super important if you want to be successful in my mind. So I consider myself as a very ordinary student, honestly, still to date. Uh, but I was persevere and hardworking. So that's very important. Third one, be patient. Uh, so I have heard this from one of our professors who taught algebra at FAU, uh, he said like, there's a shortcut, which is always long. So don't try to go on that shortcut. The students always want to do a shortcut, but shortcut might be super long. So, so, and also it's never too late to do the right thing, right? If you really think about my case, I never regretted, like regret of doing the second PhD. I felt like it was the right thing to do at that point. I was actually almost ABD in my second PhD in finance, but then switched to operations because I really felt like finance is too empirical, not challenging enough, but operations is challenging enough for me. So I felt like that was the right decision. It was never too late. Uh, I was the youngest probably when I did my first PhD. I was the oldest when I did my second PhD among the cohorts, but it was never too late. So to do that uh, and yeah, in terms of shortcuts, I think the shortcuts will be always take you to, through the longer routes, right? 
so this was the quote I had in my first dissertation. So always believe in you. You have something superior to the situation. If you don't believe in that, you will not be able to overcome the situation in many cases. I personally don't take pictures with uh, famous people, which is something I try to not to do. Uh, Shridhar might be the only person I have taken a picture with and asked to take a picture with. I met him a couple of times. He's a, a, a operations uh, a management professor at Carnegie Mellon. Shridhar Thayur, he has his own company called SmartOps. SmartOps was developing toolbox uh, for consulting for SAP. Eventually, SAP realized that they make a lot of money. SAP bought his company. He started a private jet company to help people to do the organ transplant. So I respected for him that. And he gave me a lot of life advices. Like he said, he's in the space of his life where he will be giving right now. But the main reason I picked him for this presentation, he said something about culture of Carnegie Mellon. He said when he joined Carnegie Mellon, Everybody was doing, he was doing uh, things to survive, just the sake of publishing a paper, to get the A for the class and just to survive. But when he looked around, everybody is doing to thrive, not to survive. Everybody is killing it. He said like, why can't I do the same thing? And he said, after switching from doing things to survive to uh, doing things to thrive, his life completely changes. He started the smart groups. He, he was very successful. He's probably to date, like if I can think of 10 top scholars in the area in operations, he's one of those. And then he said he was super successful. And he told me that advice as a PhD student. I think this photo I took when I was faculty, met him in DC a long time after that. So I think uh, when I did give the same advice to some university students, I got some emails from students. We will work hard and we will try, we will not try to survive. So hopefully some of you will get the message. So so don't do things to, just to survive, just do it for, to kill it. I actually do it even today. If I have a paper, if I feel like I can improve the paper a little bit more, I have even told like my co-authors, if we don't improve this part, I might not want to be in this project because I think we can improve. Just don't do the papers for the sake of publishing because we want to do good quality work, right? So this was me, and this is me. Uh, more than 20 years ago, this was taken at the Freshers' Welcome. Uh, I was singing with another colleague from uh, my batch. So recently we were giving gifts for, in 2020, we were giving gifts for our batchmates. So this was my kind of quote for my batchmate. Uh, but I, I didn't pick this, randomly i picked this for a reason when i was looking for this video and the photo i found a very old hard drive i copied one folder uh, the name of the folder was my future which was a folder i used when i was an undergraduate student in sri lanka in 2004 so i'll start with this one so this was uh, actually uh, folder I used in 2009 when I was going for my second PhD in finance. Uh, so these are the six schools I applied to. I think I had an interview with Northwestern. So it, they asked me a very tricky question, why second PhD? Why should we invest in you again? So it was a very tough question. Uh, and they only admitted like two students and I wasn't one of them, but at least I got an interview. And the other three were my backups. I had an interview with Iowa. They said they are interested in more empirical person. UT Dallas was also backup. And I was in the top five, but I was not in top two. I will explain why I was not in the top two, but the main takeaway, I was rejected from UT Dallas finance program, which was not ranked. The finance program is not ranked as a research program, highly ranked. Eight months later, I got into UT Dallas PhD program in operations. And that is, you know, even today, number one PhD program in terms of research productivity. So I was rejected from the unranked program, but I got a second chance, much better second chance to get into UT DOM program. So you will get a second chance, right? 
And of course, after getting into that program, I was looking into finance program candidates. All of them were from one country and the graduate advisor was from that country. I may not have been the reason for rejection at that time. So sometimes, you know, there will be rejections in your life. You can learn something, but don't try to punish yourself for the rejections because some of those rejections doesn't make sense. It might not be you because especially in business school, PhD programs, they're very political. They will admit students based on some criteria you cannot justify, right? So, so I'm really glad like I got into Zurich program, which was much better than UT Dallas finance program, but I didn't bother too much about the rejection there. But again, you will get a second chance to go to a better place. Most of the cases, if you work hard, right? Uh, I think my admission for the UT Dallas PhD program mainly driven by uh, uh, my training in control theory. Again, I had a training in control theory and somebody at UT Dallas, like uh, his name is Suresh Sethi, he really liked control theory and as a tool for research, he just saw that as an opportunity. So that's why I got into UT Dallas program. So this is my second story. So that was 2009 when I was going for second PhD. So this beautiful picture you see on the left, it's University of Nevada, Reno. And I was I also found another folder for like 100 plus schools I wrote emails to. I had a very low TOEFL score. So I had to pick and choose and ask schools, can I apply for your graduate program in math? I was waiting for a response. And depending on their response, I decided if I'm gonna apply or not. So I, I wrote emails to 100 plus schools and I never got a response from University of Nevada, Reno. I never got a response. I recently, I worked with the same person I wrote to in a committee of three people giving fellowships for graduate students. I remember like that name, is it? Then I went back and checked that email again. Oh, that's the same person I never even got a response from. Uh, like uh, it's 15 years later, so I was recruited at uh, the same university as a professor. Uh, I don't want to tell stories about how I was recruited, but as far as I know, I was highly recruited at UNR. But I never got a response for my email to do graduate studies at the same university. Now there are graduate students who really want to do research with me at UNR. And then I could win the college-wide research award, which is probably the highest you can get as a junior faculty. Uh, and I was not even able to get a response for my email. So I got my second chance. Again, my second chance is better than my first chance. So this is a story I tell my undergrads also, even today, like they get really shocked. You really didn't get a response? I said, no. So you are better than me at this point. So because you're doing graduate studies at UNR, I was not able to do it. So you will get a second chance and don't be afraid to dream, you know, and uh, most of the dreams, if you work hard and have a plan towards it, so you can achieve it. So if you really think getting into all of these programs, getting into these R1 research universities were dreams, you know, when you are you know, doing your graduate studies, but if you really plan, you can achieve those dreams. So that's my final message. I'll take questions such it. So that's the same building, by the way. So <laughs> Yeah, it's... Uh... Very, very uh, nice talk. And I think uh, I think uh, we had about like 65 participants today. And I think most of them are students. So I strongly believe that a lot of students actually got uh, very insightful uh, 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 ideas from you, how you actually uh, went through your career. And um, I think it is a wonderful talk. Thank you again for Sandin Pereira. And uh, so let's see. Uh, so everyone, uh, please type your questions. I think this will be the time for you to now ask uh, uh, questions uh, to clarify. It can be anything as you see. Uh, uh, so he'll be a very resourceful person to uh, ask questions regarding how, uh, how you want to uh, go through your career in either statistics or mathematics. So yeah, please take the advantage. So uh, actually, this is kind of a question and comment uh, from probably Rashan. 
Um, uh, so he said, uh, these days we, are, we see many US organization contracts out or outsource various projects to universities or university groups, study department, computer science, data science department, etc. This is a way for companies to access highly skilled labor at a cost effective way. Can the University of Colombo get these kind of opportunities and how to go about doing it? So do you have any thoughts about that? Uh, so just to clarify, so to get projects from US or Sri Lanka? Uh, from US. I think the uh, US, yes. Hmm. So I think uh, for that, one way I can think of maybe having an MOU with a US university, I'll give a good example. Uh, this is based on research. Uh, I will be having a meeting next week uh, with the Dean of uh, Jindal School of Business, OP Jindal's Global uh, Business School in India. So they're the one of the top 10 business schools, uh, private schools. So the idea is to get some data projects from US as well as India and collaborate as a group. So one of my tasks would be to train faculty and students to publish in top journals, but uh, like for them, they can get you know into US markets. If I have a good project, which I'm working with a US company or logistic firm company or some tech company, they can be involved in that project. So that's on the, you know, uh, like uh, research part. But in terms of consulting, there might be some barriers for Indian or Sri Lankan person to do uh, because, you know, uh, they might not be able to pay you directly. So there might be some contractual issues there, which part I'm, I haven't tried. So I, I don't know too much details about that part, but uh, it has happened, you know, like like some consulting projects we do can have a, a team a member from outside the US. So um, that has happened in some of the projects, not the ones I was involved, but I remember some stories at UT Dallas. We had a consulting center called the Worker Center. So there was a lot of consulting projects, but some of those projects, there were people from Russia and some other countries outside the US. Uh, thank you. So we have another question from Niranjaka. Uh, if you are to choose a career between a research in science and research in business, what would you prefer and why? Um, I have picked already like um, research <laughs> in business. Uh, uh, I mean, there are a lot of things. I mean, let's forget about the financial benefits, uh, uh, which is there. But that's not the main reason. I always tell my students, if I ever feel like I'm teaching here for money, I will quit. Because I can go to industry, make two, three times if you're a business school professor. Because right now there's high demand for supply chain people at Amazon, companies like Amazon and other logistics companies. They're doing big data, data analytics, you know, business analytics. So that shouldn't be the main reason. But I think there, there are a lot of, in terms of headaches, we have less headaches. I don't have to write grant proposals such as, so you probably know how difficult it is to uh, write grant proposals. And then many occasions, I have written uh, collaborative proposals with my colleagues in engineering uh, on robotics and supply chain. Most of the times we don't know why they reject it. We think we have the best proposals. It's very uh, discouraging sometimes. So I don't have to deal with it. So that's a plus. Uh, and then uh, I will. I would definitely pick the uh, business one because I feel like I'm doing what I'm really enjoying: sure. optimization, data analysis, uh, uh, and cool research. And also, one one question I always had as an undergraduate student: that's one. That's one reason I switched from uh, traditional math stream to business math stream uh, in my third year. Uh, and uh, I think Dr. Premadas is here, one of my professors, uh, and then he can say more about it. And he was one of the you know founders of that programs, program uh, in uh, business math. I work with Dr. Premadas in case you don't know uh, for the proposal of the industrial statistics and uh, mathematical finance direct intake. Uh, I typed myself this project, some part of that project. I still remember those days. So one question I had was like. Where do I 
get to apply the concepts I learned in classroom in real life. Right now I can see it, you know, this UN project and one of the projects we work with the blood bank recently about the, uh, coming up with the uh, optimal donation, uh, like blood donor uh, scheduling mechanism. Those are really, you know, uh, like, I, I said this one time, uh, my sister is a doctor, but I always felt like I'm not doing enough for society or something because I'm working with this equation and all that. Of course, our service to students can cannot be underestimated, but like, I feel like I can do more in my research, right? Uh, when I look into research part, I felt, I said this at one point, like I feel like a real doctor now because I'm working on healthcare operations. So, so that is very satisfying in that sense. So I would definitely pick the business uh, research uh, in that. That's my long answer to that short question. Okay, great. <laughs> so next question is from Kushani De Silva. To apply for a PhD in finance, what is what is the field of undergraduate studies to have? Is an MBA enough to start a PhD in finance? Then she has follow-up. Uh, in your opinion, will having a math background, MSc, help secure, uh, uh, secure a position uh, in a PhD yeah. in uh, finance? So I think if you want to go for a PhD in finance, having maybe a mathematical finance or statistic background is important. Uh, if you want, like having a master's definitely going to help in the admission process. I still remember my interview uh, with University of Zurich. This is going to help some of your students. Okay, this is another advice. So learn whatever you are learning by heart. I'll tell you uh, for my interview at University of Zurich, uh, they did not ask a single question in finance. I was interviewed for a PhD program in finance. They asked me a question about strong law of large numbers. If you're from statistics, you know. They asked me to give a quick alternative proof idea during the interview. And then they asked another question about probability and measure theory. And then after three or four questions, they said, okay, I think we're gonna admit you. I had to go read another 140 applications, but you will be admitted. And I will ask my secretary to process your contract. Then at that point, I felt really relief and I asked the guy, uh, you didn't ask me any finance question. I read a lot of, lot of things about finance. Why didn't you ask about finance? He told me like, you just completed your math PhD. I wanted to make sure you know math. If you completed your math PhD and if you know math, if you come here, you will learn finance. I can, get, I, I can assure that. They said, whatever you're doing, you have learned by heart. So that's good enough for me, right? So that was, I was going for finance and only thing they care about my PhD. Other than that, they asked me all math questions. But coming back to that, having financial math background could help. Uh, statistics could help. I would say 80% eighty to 90% of the finance. That's one reason I switched from finance to operations. I felt like a little bit more empirical. Uh, so finance world is uh, purely empirical. So having statistics might be more appropriate than math. Although you think, you know, all the measure theory, financial math could help, but uh, statistics could help more. Uh, definitely having a master's. Uh, when I think about business school, like at UTD, almost 95% of the students had master's or PhDs. In my intake, 50% uh, of, of the students who came in out of four had, um, two, two out of four had PhDs, other two had master's. So having master's definitely going to help you. Yeah, I think this can be a very uh, kind of follow-up question from Sachini. Uh, so I have a BSc in statistics and MSc in financial mathematics. Are these qualifications enough to apply for a PhD position, MSc plus PhD in the area of statistics or uh, act actuarial science? Yeah. Yeah, statistics and actuarial science, I think definitely is yes, more than qualified, right? I mean, undergraduate alone should be enough, in my opinion, uh, but it depends on where you apply also, right? Some statistics programs, again, if you think about Columbia, so the Columbia statistics program work very closely with the business school. So Columbia has a very 
different business school because it's a IOR kind of school. They are very technical. Uh, I know somebody who works in statistics for two years and then did work in the business school for two years and got the PhD. So in business, uh, so they work in a slightly different model. So those top programs still would be tough. I mean, you have to have very high GPA, very high scores for this standardized test and all that. Uh, but definitely you satisfy the basic requirement to apply. That would be the short answer. But uh, if you have master level qualifications, I would say, I mean, I know I had to go to FAU for a reason. Uh, at that time, I was uh, explaining, you know, my uh, issues with my TOEFL. At that time, we had only one paper-based exam. We could take only once. I took it in my fourth year. And then if, if the next exam would be in six months. So you cannot retake it immediately, just like right now. But I still recommend, you know, you should you should go for like uh, high rank schools. Uh, I learned that lesson after my first uh, one. But also, I mean, being loyal to... Uh, the people who gave you opportunity is important. I'll share another story. Most of you don't know. Within my first semester after joining FAU, I met a professor from FSU, Florida State University. She invited me to join FSU very next semester. I didn't do it. And then, I, then later on, I told the graduate advice at FAU, you know, Betty Ann invite me to go to FSU and I didn't go. Or oh, you could have gone. I mean, uh, you you were career would have been different, but I didn't take that because I felt like if you gave me the opportunity, so I wanted to do the justice for that, but that's a side story. Uh, but, yeah. yeah. So, uh, just to follow up, uh, so uh, we actually, Cuffs, uh, we Cuffs, uh, actually organized uh, how to apply for graduate studies, etc., some kind of panel discussion last year. So, um and maybe i thought this will be a good opportunity for you to uh tell uh math and stat student uh now i think you covered a little bit uh uh a bit and pieces uh here and there so but like uh what are the important things that when they actually select a uh, university like uh uh what what things they should consider like uh, their strength and uh, uh how to pick a right university correct university like how to pick like a also if they want to acquire like a really a position a safe university etc so from your experience what do you suggest for a student mm. so i think this answer maybe could be two part uh i, I think the if you I think we have experts in terms of applying to science, right? Uh, do you want to more uh, like more specific or more customized answer? No, yeah, wow, well, well, yes, yeah, Pro, yeah, it's fine. Yeah, either way is yeah. fine. <laughs> yeah. So I think yeah, like based on my experience, like uh, if you come into science major, like uh, I would say, I mean, this is again my opinion. Uh, some people like the idea of delaying it and then getting into a better program next year, I would say come whatever position you get. If you do well in that program, you can get a good recommendation and go to a better program. So that's, you know, you will not waste uh, time in your life. You will learn something and you will get a better opportunity, you know, and you can transfer within PhD programs in science, right? But going to higher rank program is super important. Uh, and I remember Dr. Premadas was telling us like, Oh, you should at least go to Big Ten. Like, uh, you know, don't apply to these schools. So, and uh, and that's true, you know, because uh, getting a degree from higher rank schools is going to help you. Uh, there are only very few people who graduated from a lower rank school and get a position in a higher rank school. So usually it works other way around. So that's in general for science, right? But coming back to business schools, I think the soft skills part, I'll be very picky about it. Like, if I see a 4.0 student uh, who has done exceptionally well, but I have not seen the student versus somebody with 3.6 GPA, but I have seen this student as a master's student or somebody I know from another university recommend me about you know this student from another master's program in the US saying, this person has a lot of industry in like intuition and have a nice background, very well grounded and good presenter, you know, and, you know, writing is really good. 
I will take that student with 3.6 GPA because, you know, for me, it's less risky because I have more insights about the soft skills of the student. So if you are going to apply for a basic school, unless you really get lucky, uh, go from undergraduate directly from or masters directly from Sri Lanka to a business school, try to come to a program, either MBA or MS in certain areas, or uh, even in, it could be MS in statistics or MS in applied math, but then you will get to see the faculty and convince them. So, because I think most of the business schools, since they admit one to two students in a cohort, like they really don't want to take a risk. So they will, you know, like to see the students have a one-on-one -on -one interview and they really care about the soft skills because it's all about placement. If I have a PhD student, if I don't place that PhD student in a tenure track position, that's a failure for me in business school world. Uh, postdoctoral position is a failure. I mean, in most of the cases, unless student really picked that for a good reason. Like as I said, going to industry to get experience with a deferred placement, right? So because of that, we don't want to take that risk. So so we'll be very picky in that sense. So we would like to see the student. And uh, there have been cases, uh, you know, like some people with very hard, good hard skills, like super smart and had very good publications, but they never got good placements because of the you know, lack of soft skills. So I would say come to program in US and then you can probably get a master and go to a high rank business school program. And also in, when it comes to placement, the business school people are less open-minded in the sense like they will be, they will not take a huge risk to hire somebody they think could be very super smart. They might just hire within peers. So we are hiring in quick pace, right? Like top, 10, 15 universities only hire within. And then other schools hire slightly above them. So they will less likely to take a risk. So in that sense, doing a PhD in highly ranked program is more important in the business world. Thank you. Thank you for uh, all your um, uh, suggestions for the students. So I don't know whether this is related, but uh, let me ask you anyway. So one person asked, uh, math or statistic background mostly needed uh, to be a quantitative analyst. Uh, so do you have any comment about that? You mean quantitative analysis, analyst in industry? Uh, it, uh, the, I'm not sure. The, yeah, that's what, what I was also wondering. Uh, the question was not clear. So maybe, yeah, maybe you can uh, answer the question related uh, on that line. I think, yeah, I mean, it's, it's important, right? Um, since I talked about AI, so I always talk about this in classes, like uh, we don't want to be replaced by AI, right? So there are different levels of AI right now, but the okay, high level. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, he replied financial quantitative analysis analyst so uh, the question is about like having that kind of background is good for to go yeah. to industry as a quantitative yeah. analyst yeah yeah def I definitely so. yes yeah. uh, I'll, I'll talk about two things when i graduated with my phd in financial math i got an offer from one guy from a trading desk he said i can't tell you your salary but i'll give you 10 to 15 percent of our share that was a joke. It was in a trading desk mm -hmm. in Wall Street. But it is very risky, right? But right. The, those jobs in uh, like Wall Street and in trading desk are very highly paid jobs. If you want to take the risk, you definitely have to have quantitative skills. And they wanted somebody with high level PhD training on levy modeling. You know, stock markets have jumps. So only levy modeling can do, you know, handle the jumps. So in that sense, they really welcome people with quantitative training, right? Uh, coming back to that, uh, I work on some project on FinTech and other things right now. So a lot of things are right now, you know, have been either automated or replaced by AI. So then having just basic level of quantitative skills might not be enough. 
because most of those things can be done using AI right now. So having high level training, high level masters, like if you think about master's program in Columbia or Princeton, like they have very good master's program in financial math, right? Or maybe uh, having a PhD training at a different institution uh, at high level math would be more important if you really want to get a attractive job in industry right now. Because other jobs right now, they're automating a lot with the help of AI, right? So, yeah. Right. Thank you. I think uh, we can talk a lot uh, if we keep going. But uh, students, if you have any question, I'm uh, sure that the Professor Sandum Pereira will uh, answer to your questions if you email uh, as he uh, have any time. So, um, um, all right. So let's uh, move on to the next part of uh, our event. So the before that, uh, uh, so. We, CAPSA, actually organized this Distinguished Speaker Series uh, and invite uh, a lot of uh, uh, Distinguished Speakers from different areas. So if you like uh, to contact uh, the subcommittee uh, and uh, let us know your suggestions. So please write to us uh, from this email. Uh, so we are particularly interested in hearing from you with the topics and speaker suggestions. All right, so uh, so the, everything uh, uh, today, uh, so uh, everyone heard a lot of important, uh, interesting things. So, but uh, to thank the speaker uh, from today, uh, so I'd like to invite a senior lecturer from Department of Statistics, University of Colombo, Dr. Champa Magala, uh, to deliver the word of thanks. Dr. Hello. Champa, it's can you your audio. Me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. So on behalf of, behalf of the Department of Statistics, Faculty of Science, University of Colombo, I would like to thank our speaker today, Professor Sandu, uh, Sandun Pereira, uh, a proud product of the Faculty of Science, actually, uh, for his insightful talk. Uh, and also, I would like to thank COFSA for organizing this uh, Distinguished Speaker Series. And... Um, also joining the faculty of science with it because this would be really beneficial for our students uh, because mainly they are the ones who are looking for career options nowadays so i assume that they could get a proper idea how to proceed with their dreams after getting their bachelor's degree so thank you so much professor sandun uh, can i add something as far as i remember we came to us on the same day right oh. uh, professor magal Yes, yes. <laughs> you are just okay, feeling that. Just we were to me and, taking yeah. the same flight to US. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> yeah. Nice to uh, you. Thank you very much for having me. You know, uh, and again, you know, Sachit, Ashan, uh, Vikumaya, and uh, thank you, Dr. Premadas, for being here. He was, a, you know, he was hugely influential uh, in my career and. Uh, uh, I, I thought he's going to ask that question, you know, what would you have done differently? I'd ask. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah, I mean, uh, thank you everybody. So uh, it was, a, you know, it was my pleasure to be here. I was, uh, I was going to ask the other question about, uh, about how you uh, got your recommendation for English, but I would not. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, masterpiece, uh, Sandun. Thank you so much. You are wonderful. <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sandun. Then, uh, uh, so with that, uh, we'll end our uh, session today and we will see you all in our next talk, uh, probably in the uh, end of uh, February. Thank you all. Hope to see you again soon.